Welcome. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight um, to honor our um, guest, who's guest speaker tonight, Brian Wallace, who's going to talk about uh, sea turtles. Brian is a senior research scientist at APT Associates, and he's also a global authority in sea turtle biology and conservation. Now, prior to joining APT, Brian worked in academia and then in a variety of conservation or non-profit organizations. He was at uh, Conservation International, the Oceanic Society, and the World Wildlife Fund, and he's been a consultant on a variety of different projects. That. Well, whoever that person was that Nigella just introduced sounds fantastic. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have bad news. You're stuck with me. Um, thanks for coming out on a, on a Monday evening. Um, glorious weather here in Boston. Thanks for that. I was really worried coming from sunny Colorado where we have 300 or so uh, days of sun a year that I might be treated to some East Coast clouds or snow. But thanks for keeping that in February. Really appreciate that. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here, um, and you know, thanks to the aquarium, thanks to um, also to the Lowell Institute for, for sponsoring the lecture series and uh, for having me out. So um, let's talk sea turtles, shall we? Um, this, don't worry, is not actually the title of the talk. Let's, let's, get, let's get down to some, some real stuff that we actually care about, whatever that gobbledygook was. Um, we're not going there. Let's talk about summer vacations. It's about that time anyway, right? So let's see what it looks like through the eyes of leatherbacks and talking about summer vacations. So before I do that, just want to make sure we're, I like to make sure we're all reading from the same playbook here um, and give you a little introduction to leatherbacks because I'm guessing folks know a lot about right whales and humpback whales and other things like that. I'm going to introduce you to something a lot cooler. What are you laughing about? I'm, that was totally serious. Okay. Leatherbacks. So what makes them unique? Widest range of all reptiles. Um, the, the oceans to them around the world are like a big bathtub. Cold, warm, surface, deep. To them, it's all good and it's all habitat. Uh, and this makes them unique among existing sea turtle species and one of the reasons why they've been so evolutionarily successful. If you'd gone back in time about 20 million years, you would see leatherbacks swimming around along with all sorts of tiny little rodents that eventually would give rise to some uh, hairless ape that we might be somewhat familiar with. Um, so how do they do that in addition to uh, varied environments uh, being very comfortable in um, cold and warm waters and surface and deep, they, they make epic migrations across ocean basins. Um, they're able to maintain uh, headings like migratory birds or, uh, or, or other animals you've probably been made famous, uh, but leatherbacks rank right up there. Largest reproductive output, so that's a big way of saying when it's breeding season, leatherbacks go hard. Um, they, they'll, they'll, in a given season, there are a couple hundred eggs, there are multiple clutches of eggs, so it's not just kind of a one and done thing, and they'll do this every few years for their entire reproductive lifespan, which could be decades. And then, of course, the thing that captures everybody's imagination and attention it, when seeing a leatherback, whether it's on a ginormous screen or in person, if you're so lucky, um, this is a big turtle. These are, these are quite big. And to translate kilograms into pounds, uh, these are easily 500 to 1,000 plus pounds uh, routinely. So before I dive in to kind of a more site-specific perspective um, on some of the work that, that I and uh, a lot of colleagues have done over the years, I, I want to give you a, the global context of how are leatherbacks doing, okay? So I just talked about them being distributed widely across the globe. The uh, black diagonal lines indicate, generally speaking, where in the world's oceans leatherbacks might be found. The orange dots and black dots indicate nesting sites around the world. Um, so, of course, as I mentioned before, they're distributed from really high latitudes through the tropics and across all the major ocean basins. But even though, technically speaking, it's just one species it's that, that encompasses that entire distribution, um, it really depends on where you look to get a glimpse as to how leatherbacks are actually doing. In the Pacific Ocean, the situation is not so good. Um, both the Western Pacific and Eastern Pacific populations have declined precipitously over the last 20 to 30 years. The Indian Ocean is a little bit of a question mark. We know a lot about the ones nesting in South Africa. It's a relatively small and stable population, but those in the North Indian, we're not really sure, although the situation doesn't sound 
Great. And then we move over to the Atlantic, and it's a completely different story. And it's this story that I'm hoping to tell over the next three to four hours. Um, <laughs> what? Isn't that how long these are? No. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so we might, I might have to go to my other presentation. Just kidding, everybody. Don't worry. There are refreshments outside, right? I'm pretty sure. And here in the Atlantic, it's, it's another story, especially in this particular region right outside of your backyards in the Northwest Atlantic. Tens of thousands of females per year, and the population in general is stable or increasing depending on where you're looking. And this is the question that has, has intrigued a lot of us for a long time. This was kind of one of the primary questions of my PhD research, was why these leatherback populations are so different. And most importantly for us tonight, why do, what do summer vacations have to do with that? Um, what is it about fine scale habitats for a species that's so widely distributed for which going a few thousand miles between breeding and feeding areas is no big deal. What is it about where they spend focused amounts of time in focused areas that might shed some light on, on this important question? So just drilling down a little bit further, um, in addition to those population trends being different, there's also some, really, there's some other really interesting differences about uh, leatherback populations globally. And I'm going to focus on uh, the population here in the North Atlantic and then the East Pacific is the one that I've got the most personal experience with um, in, in the Pacific side of Costa Rica. Um, don't, don't cry for me. It, it was okay. I, <laughs> I made it. I managed to suffer through. Uh, during Philadelphia winters, I was on Costa Rican beaches. Some people have to do it. I'm sorry. Um, the Eastern Pacific leatherbacks, again, same species, a lot of the same behaviors in general. If I showed you a picture of one next to the other, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference unless I managed to give you a sense of the difference in size. So the Eastern Pacific turtles are much smaller. They lay fewer eggs per clutch. And really importantly, they don't breed as frequently as leatherbacks here in the North Atlantic. Even for a really long-lived species that's going to reproduce many, many times over its life, it really matters if you can come back twice as fast and breed, it turns out. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, of course, the population status. And from a management perspective, um, obviously, this is the, this is the trend that, that troubles us the most. But what we want to know is, do the, do, is there something about the population status and about all these biological parameters that are somehow linked? And if so, if we can kind of unlock that, that story a little bit, uh, we might learn some things that we can apply to how we manage or how do we, how do we further study the Eastern Pacific population. So now that we've already gone around the world and back again, clearly there's one person standing in front of you, but there are a lot of people who've contributed um, equally or much more than I have to a lot of the work that I'm going to show you here. Um, and there's just a very, very short list of those folks, both working here in the, in the Northwest Atlantic, specifically in Nova Scotia in Canada, um, the Canadian Sea Turtle Network is the, the, the primary partner here, uh, and I'll talk about them a little bit as we go forward. And then some of the folks down there at the bottom of the list um, were my colleagues uh, who've worked on the Eastern Pacific leatherback uh, situation for many decades. And specifically, I need to, to call out uh, the, kind of the driving force, the leader of uh, the team in Nova Scotia for the last, oh, almost 15 years now. It's Dr. Mike James with the uh, Division of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. It's kind of the equivalent of our, our NOAA, if you will. Um, Mike has some fantastic stories about getting a, a, a glimmer in his eye about trying to catch leatherbacks in the cold Nova Scotian waters with a uh, pretty ridiculous homemade hoop net that the fishermen all laughed at him about. Uh, but 15 years later, they're all very close friends and have their, their system pretty well down and have learned some absolutely incredible things in a relatively short period of time. So much of the work that I'll talk about with, Nova, in, with respect to Nova Scotia um, really and truly would not have existed or occurred without Mike and his team. So I'm proud to be here to present on behalf of them. Leatherbacks in Canada? Now that sounds kind of crazy. We're talking sea turtles here. I thought I'm picturing, you know, sandy beaches and, uh, and, and high humidity and the tropics and a little fruity drink or something. Well, they might have those in Canada. We might have to ask these guys. They might be able to shed that light on you. Um, but in, tr in fact, leatherbacks in Canada, indeed. Um, those two guys there on the left are uh, Bert Fricker, who's a 
is a, a fisherman for many generations. He and his family have been fishing out of Cape Breton in northern Nova Scotia, and his son Ben with a leatherback on a little homemade uh, uh, little stern ramp they use when they catch a turtle to get it up on the, uh, out of the water. All those locations are sightings, entanglements, strandings, captures, etc., of leatherbacks in Canadian waters over, over a, a, a great period of time. So yes, in fact, leatherbacks in Canada and New England. Mm -hmm. If you didn't know already, right out of your backyard, well, maybe not your backyard, your back ocean, harbor, <laughs> off of New England, uh, also an extremely important area for leatherbacks. Um, and we, uh, we have the honor and privilege right now of the woman in this picture who's here right now ready to correct any of my mistakes, which is really good and a lot of pressure for me. Dr. Cara Dodge up here, who's been doing something very similar. Stand up, Cara, so they know who you are. If you don't know, who, or just wave if you want. There you go. So your very own. So don't look at me like, oh, cool, a leatherback expert was here. No, no, here she is. There you go. All your questions go right there. Uh, but, but really fascinating nonetheless. Okay, so these are species that breed in the tropics. But here we have in the Northwest Atlantic, um, the continental shelf of North America is an extremely important area for leatherbacks, which we've learned over lots of time. Everything I just said about Mike could basically search and replace Mike and Cara, and you've got a similar story. The amazing amount of work that her and her team have done over the years. Okay, so what does a, a migration of a leatherback look like between Nova Scotia and the wider Caribbean, or at least what is it about summer vacations? Why am I referring to it that way? So what you have here are each, uh, each row is a different, a different turtle. Okay, you can't really see my pointer, but that's all right. Just take my word for it. The, uh, the A and the B in parentheses are two different turtles, and these are just general um, tracks over time. So in, s in the late summer and early fall is when leatherbacks tend to concentrate on the Scotian shelf. Um, and into the fall, later in the fall, as you can see there, kind of early October and November, and this depends on the season and water temperatures and all sorts of things, that tell leatherbacks it's time to get moving, similar to birds, of course, heading south. Um, leatherbacks take off from the high latitudes and start moving south. Uh, into the winter, and this depends on whether they're adults or subadults, whether they're in a breeding year or they're not. This is just to give you a kind of a stylized picture of, a, of, an, of an annual cycle. Uh, but if they're a breeding female, they'll actually, from Nova Scotia, they'll go all the way to their beach. Um, but in the winter, they'll sort of overwinter at lower latitudes and start moving north again. In the spring, they'll be close to or arriving back on the continental shelf, but not quite into Nova Scotian waters until, again, late summer, uh, early fall. So that gives you kind of the, the idea of uh, why I might be calling these summer vacations, because, in fact, that is when they show up in Nova Scotia. So what does the work look like? Well, even though it's summer, it's not the summer that I know and enjoy where I live, I can tell you that much. Uh, not quite as pleasant, definitely not as sunny, and, and much wetter and colder. But for leatherbacks, this is no big deal. For them, cold water feels just fine. They have, they're unique among reptiles, and, and sea turtles included, their ability to thermoregulate or to maintain very warm body temperatures in very cold waters. Um, this turtle in particular was one of the biggest that uh, the Canadian Sea Turtle Network has ever captured. If this turtle, if I put it on the back end of its carapace or top end of its shell right next to me, the shell itself would be the same height as I am. This turtle at the time we estimated probably weighed something like 600 kilos, so well over 1,000 pounds, um, more like 1,300, 1,400 pounds potentially. Um, so What's really interesting about the work that Mike and his team and Karen and, their, and, and her team have done over the years is been able to set up and establish the linkages between where these animals might be breeding, where they might have actually come from, to end up being received in these high latitude foraging areas. So, for example, what, what Mike and his team will do when they, when they capture a turtle is they'll check it for microchips. So these typically, if they don't have a little external, like a cattle tag almost, on their flippers, then they scan it for a microchip. If it has a microchip, they check to see their own database if they were the ones who tagged it. If so, they've got data on the last time they saw it, how big it was then, etc. But if it has a tag and it's not one of theirs, then they send up the bat signal to the Caribbean and say, hey, whose is this? Turns out this turtle in particular was from French Guiana in South America. 
And once I got in touch with the French Guiana and colleagues, they learned that not only, yes, had that turtle nested in the past in French Guiana, it had nested every two years, like clockwork, from 1994 through, at the time that was captured, 2008. Every two years, like clockwork. And so we knew when, when this turtle was captured, she was in a breeding year, that if we got a satellite transmitter on her, we would track her back to French Guiana. No problem. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. So these tracks here are uh, a bunch of tracks from turtles in that particular year. Uh, this is maybe not totally clear, but uh, where things are clustered up here. It's Nova Scotia, right, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, and the little uh, green track there is that turtle you just saw on the previous slide. This is pretty, uh, th this is somewhat unusual to be able to actually have your transmitter work all the way back to a nesting beach. And so we were on pins and needles while this animal got there in like late February, early March. So not quite nesting season. And we're just praying for the thing to keep transmitting. Keep going. She just hung out off the nesting beach for about th three weeks or so, two or three weeks. And uh, sure enough, she nested. So this is the same animal about six months later. It was up in Canada in the cold water, and then through some pretty remarkable international collaboration, communication, and cooperative management of the shared resource across thousands of miles in different languages and everything else, this one turtle went from the back of a boat in Nova Scotia to a, 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 a rainy tropical beach in South America. So clearly this connectivity between breeding and feeding areas is, is a, it's, a, it's well established at this point, but it's also a really, really important thing to keep in mind when thinking about how challenging it is to right the ship in cases where populations might not be doing so well. This isn't a, a simple thing like, well, even this isn't simple, but where a species might have a very restricted range that's under the jurisdiction of just one agency or something like that. No, this is a little bit different. Everywhere we see a little circle is a place where Mike and his team have had some confirmed linkage, whether it's through genetics or tag returns or uh, satellite tracks, like I just described before. So throughout the wider Caribbean, and yet every summer, that big mishmash of leatherbacks concentrates in a, in a relatively small area. Now, one of the other really interesting things, and this is going to be where we kind of pivot into some of the specifics of what I'll be talking about from now on, is that the same turtles, while they're in Canada, are big and fat. They're 33% heavier on average for a given body size when they're in Canada than when they're on the breeding grounds. This has everything to do with why they're in Canada and then why they go to the breeding grounds. They're in Canada to tank up. They're here in New England to tank up. There's a lot of good food and there's a lot to eat and they know when it's going to be here. They know. Their brains are the size of your finger, but <laughs> they know what they need to know. Let's put it that way. So um, it may, might be hard to tell from the photos, but you know, the way we think of the, the foraging animals is almost like they're, well, let me just show you. Like an inflated football, for example. <laughs> um, and what, what, is, there, is, that, is that familiar to anybody here? I'm with you guys, by the way, I just want to tell you. And I mean that, not just because I'm actually here and you could throw things at me. <laughs> but is that clear enough? Is that, okay, all right, we'll keep going. So where you spend your summer, exactly, right, this is, should we go back to this? I feel like we should talk about this some more. We need some, you guys want, I'm a Browns fan, so who needs the therapy, really? Come on, you know, sorry, where, I hope your rings aren't weighing you down. Uh, no sympathy. So, this is going great. Uh, <laughs> So where you spend your summer matters. As I mentioned before, um, this is important from a management perspective. This is a shared resource, but also an endangered resource, uh, listed in both the U.S. and in Canada. Um, as I mentioned before as well, they might have you know, enormous ranges, but they, they, they tend to focus in a relatively small area and only for a specific amount of time. There's no breeding that happens in Nova Scotia or here in New England. And this is, it. this is important to bring up just because um, with sea turtles, and my fellow sea turtle experts in the room can, can definitely sympathize, we tend to be pretty land focused because in a sense we're lucky. The species that we study have a terrestrial phase. They have to come onto beaches. That tends to make it a lot easier to study 
those kinds of animals and others that have no terrestrial face. So we tend to have a pretty land-based bias. So being able to convince managers and other resource users that even though it's not a breeding area, it's still really, really important, is a lot harder than you think. Um, highest density is known for this species. Again, you saw kind of how widely dispersed they are. So for them to come to a relatively small area for them at a, at a, at a predictable time is pretty notable. From a management perspective, and here I'm talking about Nova Scotia in particular, but some similar problems um, are, are encountered by leatherbacks here as well. So throughout the, the North American shelf is entanglements in fishing gear. Uh, the mortality in Canada is estimated as somewhere around 20%. These are adults and subadults. From a population perspective, those are the most important individuals. You can't really afford to lose too many of those without your and, and have your population sustain that kind of loss. Okay, so that, that turns out to be important, even though there are a lot of them, as I showed you before. And so the culmination of all these factors means that, that Canada and New England, Canada, and since that's what I'll be talking about here, has a disproportionately large impact on the, essentially the fate of, of leatherbacks in the, North, in the North Atlantic. But how important are these waters? As I mentioned before, this is not an easy thing to convince people of because we have so much information from nesting beaches, so much information about terrestrial phase that it's not always clear. So we've taken a, a little bit of a different approach. Um, we're trying to actually quantify the importance of that really productive uh, feeding time for leatherbacks, that tank up time, as in the context of its overall energy budget. So this is something like, think about your own household budget, right? You've got costs, you have intake, you have income. That net, of course, is gonna determine a lot of things, how you invest, other things you buy, other things you spend on, um, whether they're you know, absolute necessities or there are other things that you really want to do. Well, it turns out energy is kind of that currency for animals. And for leatherback, the more energy or revenue they can net, the more they can invest in reproduction, coming back more frequently, making more eggs. Um, they can sustain those long migrations. They can sustain the diving deep and into cold waters, etc. So if they're here, if they're up in Canada, basically to, to, to make the bank account full, then this is, this is a place where we can kind of add value in quantifying the, the, the importance of those areas. So how would we do it? Um, in this case, lots of cool toys. <laughs> um, and a, a heck of a lot of pretty arduous field work, of course. I don't, I don't want to uh, dismiss that, but my role has come in much more on the back end, fortunately for me, although being in the field is a lot of fun too. Um, we've used a kind of a combination of tools, of, of cool uh, technology and gadgets. Satellite transmitters, as we mentioned before, huge advantages, absolutely revolutionized how we understand how migratory species move through environments. Um, but for all of that amazing information that we get remotely, sitting, on our, sitting in our little our desks and computers and we can track where our animals are going, we always kind of have to apply a little bit of imagination to what's actually happening beneath those tracks. Even if, even if they're telling us something about how deep our animals are diving, what the water temperatures are there, we know a lot and we've learned a lot but we just never, uh, those, those transmitters don't give us that turtle's eye view of what it is they're really doing and, 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 and how that varies depending on where they are and then how it would matter, how it would translate. So, enough talking, pal. Let's see a video. That's so cool on this big screen. Okay, so what you're looking at, the black dot out in front is a leatherback. Dr. James here is about to get his video camera and he's hanging on a, a little like wakeboard that's tied to the bottom of the bowsprit. Now they devised this uh, highly technologically advanced uh, contraption over, go figure, trial and error. Now you're going to see the turtle pop up right in front here, and they're just kind of maintaining a very slow heading right behind the turtle. They don't, get, they don't get too worried about the whole thing. And just as she's up to breathe, suction cup right on her back. Now what's cool about this is, and why they, they, had, to go, they had to figure out this kind of a contraption for attachment, is that if they captured the animal and then put the camera on, the turtle was so spooked that the first half an hour to an hour or maybe more was the turtle just freaking out, right? Well, that's not natural behavior. Plus, these are cameras. These things only last for a couple hours. 
So you want to get as much natural behavior as possible. So what you're going to see here is within a minute, a minute and a half of getting a, 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 one of our scientist toys attached to her, she's right back to her natural behavior. She's just cruising. If this was a penguin or a shark or something, this thing would be moving a lot faster, but it is a turtle, just to remind you. Uh, but you'll see here that pretty soon something's going to come into view that explains pretty much everything about why they come all the way up to Canada in these soupy green cold waters every summer. What's that? Chow time. That's what that is. That is a very, very big lion's mane jelly, and they are absolutely delicious, apparently. <laughs> so I'm told. <laughs> so as you can see now, um, leatherbacks are not the cleanest eaters. This kind of <laughs> reminds me of my almost two-year-old, in fact. Um, unfortunately, she doesn't have an 80-pound Labrador camped out underneath her chin the way my kid does. but. So what this kind of information gets us, or where we're going with this, here are some tracks from these devices. So not only are they cameras, but they also tell us something about depth, which I'll show you in a second. And they also have GPS devices on them. So we get these tracks over the surface of the water. And one of the things we did was, in, a, in, in all the footage we have for, the, for these devices, we could count how many jellyfish the turtles saw during, the, during that, that time they were swimming and get a sense of, even though this isn't the way we would scientifically collect this information, leatherbacks did it for us, so you know, we're going to cut them some slack. Jellyfish density, right? Because we want to get a sense of how would these values just generally compare to other places where people are actually measuring these things. And so this is over several years. You can see there's a, quite a variety in the, the, the prey density that we see um, from this footage. What you'll also see, and this is important, of course, is that uh, all of these tracks so still on the continental shelf. That, that line right there, 200 meters, is typically our, where we draw the line between on the shelf and then off the shelf or into more open ocean. This turns out to be a very, very important uh, detail. So what can we do beyond just like, wow, cool, just ate another jellyfish? We can break this down, turn it in, you know, like us scientists, we take all things cool and turn it into something really nerdy and probably not as interesting. Uh, but to us, this is like the best. So we can break up this video into, um, we can quantify the behaviors, basically. Not only the behaviors, but most importantly, energy intake. Remember, we're talking about how much do they spend and how much do they bring in. So a typical dive cycle, animal might start up here, taking a breath, starts with a dive, obviously, searching, then sees some prey, then captures the prey, which you've seen, and you'll see a little bit more of it here in a second, and then prey handling, right? So this is... This is something that in, in other types of animals, think of, uh, think of a cheetah, right? Prey handling turns out to be a pretty costly endeavor. In fact, it could cost them their lives if they try to handle the wrong thing at the wrong time and don't get it just right. Jellyfish, not so much of a concern there. <laughs> uh, but it still is something important that we try to keep in mind in terms of quantifying the behavior of all of these, uh, uh, the energy uh, expenditure of all these behaviors. So there are a couple things we wanted to learn from these videos. Well, there are a lot of things we wanted to learn. Um, one of the things was, of course, how many jellyfish can a leatherback eat, right? And what is that feeding rate? And then when we translate that to energy, how much can a leatherback bring in in a typical foraging season? So in this relatively, and I'll show sort of a part of this video here, but see if you can count how many jellies this one turtle captures in just a few minutes. And, I, and the reason you're like, well, I think I can count to like three or four or whatever it's going to be, you're already zenning out. I can see it. <laughs> you're in the IMAX. This is like, this is just totally awesome, right? I mean, it, it's taken a lot for me to not just kind of take a seat and have a look at this. So we, we scientists do, uh, do have like similar reactions to, to these kinds of things. Keep in mind, for all the years that we study these things, we never get to see this. Even if it's for a couple hours per animal, we are seeing where they're going. We're seeing what they see, how they capture their prey. We see their heads moving around, looking for things. Um, it, this is, we, we get to see them at the surface for the most part. We get to see them via their tracks. But when we see this, I can't tell you just the, kind of the, the, the unquantifiable um, knowledge, I guess, is the best way to put it, that we get just by seeing them actually behave. 
in their natural environment. So how many are we up to, by the way? Two. Two, that's it. Okay, well, here we go. Here we go. So one thing you should be noticing is, wait a minute, it hasn't come back to the surface, right? So she's already noshed on two of them. Uh, spoiler alert, there's more. <coughs> this is one of the things we wanted to know about. This is kind of that prey density thing. How many jellies could they actually find while they're down there? And how, what, what is that density? Where are these things distributed? And how are they finding them? That will lead to the second question, the, the big question we wanted to know. We can quantify, we can count how many jellies, right? Is that three? Okay. Just wait. Still chewing, right? Still chewing. Don't forget. Oh, there we go. Look at that guy. Still chewing. You can still see the tentacles from, I don't know, one, two, or three, and then boom, there's four. So this is pretty interesting, right? Those are some big jellies, by the way. So one of the things we did with these videos was we actually compared the size of the bell, that's, that's what you call the big umbrella part of a jellyfish, to the size of the head of the turtle, and did some geometry to figure out, estimate basically the size of the bell, and then translate that to energy. Now, how much energy is actually in that jellyfish? These are big, man. These things are, these things are about this big across on average, OK? Oh, geez, she's still going. Still no breath. But don't forget, this has been, what, two minutes, three minutes? The longest dive recorded for a leatherback is almost an hour and a half. Now, not in Canada, not in New England. That's an interesting thing to keep in mind. So, conclusion one. <laughs> my scientific conclusion, amazingly, my co-authors didn't let me keep this in the paper. I don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> but I get to tell you now because they're not here. Pac-Man, or Ms. Pac-Man. So what can we do with these things? In addition to being wowed by how many jellies they can cram in their gullet in one dive, which is actually extremely important and interesting, so we build these, these things called ethograms. These are just patterns of behavior over time. If I put one of these things on you, uh, don't worry. I know, aside from it sounding a little creepy, just go with me <laughs> on this. I could track where you've been and the kinds of behaviors you've done, right? That's what I'm doing here with, with the turtles. This blue line in the bottom graph is depth, so as they're diving, how, how far down they're going. When they come up to the top here, these are number of breaths we can quantify. These are number of jellies they're capturing during those dives. Without these cameras, we don't get any of that. We get the dive trace, but we're only guessing as to what it is they're actually doing without this kind of information. And even more fine scale, in addition to breaths, we can count how many jellies we actually see, the number they actually take, which it turns out, as you could see from that last example, they barely ever pass them up from what we can see. <laughs> um, but we also get a sense of how many bites they take. I mean, we, we're getting down to some fine scale stuff for animals for which we've got thousands of kilometers of tracks. So the other thing we wanted to know about was where are they capturing these jellies? What is it about their dive behavior in these foraging areas that's unique? How are they using the water column? Well, this video will show you a pretty good example. The last one, you know, you could kind of tell what's lighter, so the surface. In this one, it's much more obvious. All of a sudden, you see a silhouette. Is it a jellyfish? Is it a plastic bag? Is it something else? The leatherback? She's in grub mode, man. That looks good. So what we learned was, conclusion number two, leatherbacks hunt like sharks and a lot of other predators. They use the silhouetting of the prey against the light of the surface to figure out where that thing is, and of course for a sneak attack. Now, as you can see, leatherback versus jelly is not exactly going to be on Animal Planet at any <laughs> point here soon, but uh, you get the idea. So, my, again, highly scientific diagram to sort of sum all this up. There's your Pac-Man shark, leatherback. Um, what we want to know is, again, when we bring all this video and dive data together, how do leatherbacks use the water column? And, and that's just a fancy way of saying from surface to whatever's available to them. How are they swimming through that to find their prey? So they've got a lot of options. As I mentioned before, they do dive deep. They can handle cold temperatures. Um, so are they use, how much of that are they actually using? So in this particular diagram here, we go from uh, up top, of course, is the shallower water. There's still light penetrating, as you can see from the videos. And it's relatively warm, whereas you go down deep, you lose the light you get into much, much colder waters, especially in Nova Scotia. So what we're finding is, 
and what we've seen from other work and from other places, that jellies, because as you can see, they're not exa exactly the most active swimmers, they don't really power through anything, they go with the flow, right? They tend to be structured in environmental, environmentally interesting areas that tend to press things like jellies together. And one of those things is called the thermocline. Uh, it's kind of a good proxy for where lots of things happen all at once. And it just means that it's an area where water temperature changes very, very quickly with almost no change in depth. And lots of things get concentrated there, including, it turns out, jellies. So this is pretty much what a leatherback, sorry, Pac-Man shark does. <laughs> we'll swim down to the thermocline and just work the thermocline because it knows once it hits there or even goes through, if once it comes back up, it's going to have the light to help it silhouette. And so what we find is that over 80% of captures occur at the bottom of a dive, not the bottom of the ocean, but the maximum depth that a turtle would reach on a given dive, or on the ascents. And it might be more, actually, if you include the captures that we recorded as them making at the surface. They probably still were getting them via the, the silhouette mechanism. So what does this mean? This is really important, again, coming back to our energy budgets. This means that they're spending time in shallow, uh, shallow water, so they don't have to dive as deep, they're not holding their breath for as long, right? In the light, which makes sense, they're visual predators. Um, they're not, we've found that uh, through other studies that they're generally, they're not foraging at night. Um, and in relatively warm water, again, that's important. Because for every degree difference between their core temperature and the ambient temperature, that's energy they have to spend, right? So it turns out that this strategy works pretty well for energy conservation. So now, what are the whiz-bang totals? The answer to that, that first question. On average, across all the footage we've looked at, roughly two captures per dive. Each dive lasts something like four and a half, five minutes. So 16 captures an hour. And then if you allow me the, the extrapolation to roughly 14 hours or so uh, in, in a day length at that latitude at that time of year, talking around 200 captures a day, roughly 200 kilos of food a day. So that's could be anywhere between a third to 100% of their body mass, depending on how big they are, just generally speaking there. So now we've looked kind of at this energy intake side. How does that balance with the costs? Don't panic. It's just a graph. I'll explain it. So what these little stacked bar graphs mean here, these are um, the amount of energy that a leatherback would need to spend. Um, so the different colors represent different things they need to spend it on. Reproduction is that dark gray bar on the top. Non-reproduction, here I'm just referring to how much it costs to migrate, to maintain body temperatures and different water temperatures, etc. Uh, and then foraging. The foraging costs we calculated specifically for how much it costs to be in cold water in Nova Scotia. And eating cold prey, that's the same temperature as the water they're in, which means once they ingest it, they have to spend energy to warm it up right? Because it's going to be in their bodies for a while while they digest it. So the one year, two year, four year, that refers to those different remigration intervals. That means the number of years between consecutive breeding seasons. Remember I said they don't breed every year necessarily. There are a few examples of that though, so we went ahead and calculated, okay, how much energy does that, does that actually translate to? The non-breeders, I'm referring here to sub-adults, and then males, of course, that aren't investing in reproduction the same way the females are. Hold the jokes, please. So those are the costs. And so just for kind of a, 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 a simple way to look at it, if we just calculated the energy intake, right, so the revenue, for one season in Nova Scotia, this is not even counting any other way they might get energy during those time periods shown. Those percentages are the amount of energy that they get just in 90 days in Nova Scotia against any of those costs. And this is pretty remarkable. It might kind of seem like, okay, well, it's not even all of it. Remember, it's not like they only eat for 90 days in two years, okay? It just shows that that's a monumental amount of uh, proportion of their overall energy budget for that period. So again, you're remembering we're trying to quantify here that importance. And as it turns out, for males and even sub-adults, who as you saw in one of those initial figures, actually does a, a, also a multi-thousand mile migration um, even though they might not go all the way to Nesting Beach and lay eggs, one season in Nova Scotia covers 70% of their costs for a year. It's pretty remarkable. So now zooming back out. So that sounds like a lot, but how does that compare? And come back to our question of why are leatherbacks so different depending on where you are. Could this energetics thing 
make a difference or is it just some wonky thing that a scientist is saying to try to make himself sound important? Maybe from column A, maybe a little from column B. I'll let you decide. We're coming back again to this geographic variation in populations, both in trends as well as all those biological parameters I, I mentioned before. Is Canada special or are these, these foraging areas particularly important? Well, we did a global assessment of every sea turtle population in the world, including all the, the seven different subpopulations of leatherbacks. And the Northwest Atlantic, this is good news, folks, is the healthiest of all leatherback populations as of a couple of years ago. And this is in terms of characteristics of their populations as well as the threats that they're experiencing. This does not mean that they don't need protection. This just means that given the, the way that we're assessing these populations, things are looking pretty good. But of course, those things can change. We might have said something like that about the Eastern Pacific in the 1980s. There were hundreds of turtles per night coming up on a nesting beach about five miles long. And in the, my first year down there, there were 60 total for five months in just about 20 years. Many of the same things we talk about as threats to turtles in Canada or in New England would have sounded very similar to the things that we talk about, we, we now talk about as the reasons for the decline that we've observed in the Eastern Pacific. So understanding what happened in the bad cases might help us avoid those issues where we still have some, some robust, resilient populations. So in comparing the Eastern Pacific and North Atlantic, is the Northwest Atlantic population special? Is Canada special within that? These are tracks from nesting beaches in South America and in the Southern Caribbean um, over here on uh, in the Atlantic side and then contrasted to the Eastern Pacific coming out of Costa Rica. Those are about 45 or 50 tags we put out over several years in the 2000s. Um, a couple of different things might jump out at you. One, the Northwest Atlantic map looks sort of like spaghetti thrown against a wall. So they sort of use the Atlantic as their own little, um, little bathtub, as I said before. In the Eastern Pacific, we tended to see a relatively narrow, at the scale of the Pacific, corridor for migration. They spread out once they got below the equator. One of the things I want to point out, though, is the difference in, if you look at this, this color ramp here, this is chlorophyll concentration. Don't worry about that if it doesn't mean anything to you. Just trust me. The darker blue, less food, and the more red, more food, okay? Leatherbacks don't eat plankton, which you've already learned. However, we typically will use plankton as a proxy for a really productive environment for lots of things because without plankton, phytoplankton in particular, you don't have anything else anyway, generally speaking. You'll notice that up here in the, the, on the continental shelf, warmer colors. Down here where a lot of these Eastern Pacific leatherbacks end up foraging, pretty purple, doesn't look too good. And that's something that we've been really drilling into for the last, I don't know, gosh, 10 years. It does make me sound a little old. <laughs> it feels like just, you know. So this is another way of looking at it. These two maps here are also going to show something similar. Again, the sort of more productive, less productive, more food, less food. Um, but next to them, next to the maps here, uh, show the results of analysis by Dr. Vince Saba, who's a good buddy of mine, fellow grad student, uh, at Drexel University and now is up here in the Northeast and works with Dr. Dodge actually um, on a lot of important work characterizing uh, the, the coastal environment here, the continental shelf environment. So what this figure shows here, um, on the left the, the bars are for the, this population here, the Western Atlantic, North Atlantic, and then on the right the paired bars are for the Eastern Pacific. So two things I want you to try to focus on. In the top graph the bars on the right are smaller than the bars on the left. The bars on the right represent the reduced reproductive output. Remember how many eggs over time that Eastern Pacific turtles can actually make or that we observe them to make. So we know those data, we measure those data. And then the white bar is the net primary productivity or basically the, the, the relative amount of productivity in uh, the migration area, the foraging area for those animals. Both of those values lower than the same values for the Northwest Atlantic. Bottom graph, second thing I want you to check out, is the gray bars show that the, the, the actual area into which, or that, that, these, that these animals use for their migratory and foraging areas are roughly similar. They're not that different. They're both kind of equally big. But the kicker is, at a productivity by area kind of level, that bar on the right for the Eastern Pacific means that it's a lot less productive. It means that the resources are 
either harder to find because where they are in high density are going to be spread out more, or just generally speaking, the resources are going to be distributed over a wider area. Right? So this is a really important analysis because this is, again, something we were starting to hypothesize that what would be the common thread that would bring all these really interesting biological and population differences together? Well, kind of the rising tide hypothesis. And that's, that's kind of what this analysis shows. So summer vacation spots in the Atlantic apparently are a lot better than those in the Pacific if you're a leatherback. So just to nail this down, one of the things that we worked on in the past was the, the energy budget calculations that I showed before just for Canada, we've done for the population level, uh, at the population level for Northwest Atlantic and for Eastern Pacific turtles. So these bars um, increasing as you go from a one year remigration interval, of course your costs are much lower if you can turn around and come back really quickly, you're not spending a lot trying to stay warm, you're, you're concentrating everything into a short period of time. Whereas the longer you stay away, your costs go up, right? You've got a lot longer to maintain body temperatures and your salt balance and all these other things that are quite costly. Um, but one of the interesting things here is that, that on average, on a per year basis or a remigration interval basis, it actually costs more to be a Northwest Atlantic leatherback. Well, that's pretty interesting because we've already seen the actual biology behind it. And if, in fact, if all things were equal, if all resources were equal, you might assume then that Eastern Pacific turtles might be a little bigger because their costs are a little lower or that uh, their remigration interval might be quicker. But we know, uh, as I've mentioned before, that that's not actually the case. So then we calculated, all right, if those are the average costs, and this is, again, just kind of conceptual. You know, don't don't uh, go writing down the specific numbers and say, Brian told me it was this. Just, just gestalt here. The dotted lines there are the required feeding rates. So how much food would they need to eat on a per-day basis to meet that remigration interval? So in order to acquire that much energy to come back in two years, right, they'd need to f they, they would need to feed at roughly uh, somewhere around 100 to 130 kilos per day. One of the things I want to call your attention to there is that the difference between being a Northwest Atlantic turtle and an Eastern Pacific turtle isn't that much. 30 kilos a day distributed over two years, right? That shouldn't be that much. But as, we, as I've already pointed out, we don't get many turtles in the Eastern Pacific that come back after two years. We get some. But the average is more like four. And in fact, we've got records of turtles we haven't s that, that go more than 10 years between times being seen on the beach. The other take home here is that, all right, how much more would an Eastern Pacific leatherback have to eat to have its remigration interval? In other words, instead of come, taking four years to come back, how much more would it need to eat to come back in two years? which, as we've seen, has very big consequences for the overall population trend. Not much is the answer. It shouldn't take too much. This is basically, um, you know, as, we, as I showed before, this is, what, what did I say, 16 captures, 16 kilos or so per hour is what a turtle catches in Nova Scotia. So again, this shouldn't be too much. Now, again, I want you to, um, these are, this is meant to illustrate the point here. Not that, man, all they have to do is like feed for one more hour. Well, they're so lazy. <laughs> I mean, I know they're turtles, but come on, just cram a couple more jellies down and you're good. You come back in two years instead of four. What this is meant to illustrate, of course, is that they can't. For one reason or another, there are two things going on, right? There's the energy costs and then there's the intake. They could be foraging consistently, but if that foraging rate is consistently much, much lower than what their sisters in the Northwest Atlantic can get, then they're spending down all at the same time. So you never quite have enough that you can save, right? You can never quite build on that investment in the same way. And also to point out, roughly speaking, in Canada, we're, we recorded some pretty high daily feeding rates. You know, these are averages across a lot of turtles. We had some that ate less when we, the time we were watching and some that ate more. But we know that if they hit a productive patch, they can really take advantage of it. And so what all, this, all of this story tells us is that, yeah, Canada's important. New England's important. It's one of the primary reasons why this population here has been resilient enough to withstand threats, not only on nesting beaches in the wider Caribbean, but also other threats throughout their distribution, including entanglements and things like that in foraging areas. So what have we learned? Most importantly, leatherbacks are Pac-Man sharks. The leatherback guy told me that. So that's the case. But I know you all remember what I actually mean by that, and hopefully you aren't going to just remember <laughs> the little diagram.
Um, turns out foraging turtles, at least in Nova Scotia, they're good savers. They're good energy savers. Um, and there's plenty of reasons for that. One is, the, obviously, we talked about the actual behaviors they expend, and they can save energy by staying in relatively warm water, not having to dive for very long or very deep. And very importantly, if you're going to go on summer vacation in Canada, it's a good idea. You can get a lot to eat for a good price. <laughs> How important are Canadian waters to leatherbacks? Very important, clearly. You know, the, the, the little bar graph I showed you before gave us kind of an idea of for a two-year remigrant, so for a female to nest in a two-year period, just 90 days in Canada might, might meet a third of her total energy budget. It's incredible. And if you're a male or a subadult, even more, almost, almost three-fourths. So, of course, where you go on your summer vacation matters. Just ask those Eastern Pacific leatherbacks about that. And then, even though I know I made this point as a, as a declarative statement earlier, I can kind of put an exclamation mark on it now. That even though these animals might be nesting throughout the wider Caribbean, they could, they could, they could forage the northeast distant water, they can forage all, all the way over to Europe, off of Africa, etc. Where they focus, where they concentrate, where a lot of these from lots of different breeding stocks throughout the wider Caribbean, they all concentrate on the North American shelf. It's really important. That means there's a very high level of responsibility that ends up in the hands of just a couple of countries, really. Um, and so what happens here has an impact in, in what's going on and in efforts that are, are being invested throughout a lot of countries throughout the Caribbean, where folks are working tirelessly on nesting beaches to protect leatherbacks from egg harvest or from coastal development or from erosion or other things. So a disproportionately large impact on international management. So the answer to the question about whether, even if they're not breeding, is it still important to overall to population dynamics? Yes, and especially when you contrast what happens when you don't have good, reasonably priced buffets and you spend a lot more energy than you save. The good news is, of course, that we've got some pretty amazing folks doing some really important work in some tough places. Um, they've had to use a lot of innovation Definitely a lot of perseverance, um, but they've been extremely successful. They've shed light on a, an entire f phase of life history of one of the most remarkable creatures that's ever evolved on this planet so that we have a much better understanding as to where efforts can be invested, need to be invested, and to have just a better understanding of what these things do and what they've been doing for millions of years. Even though there's some goofy videos from a uh, little suction cup garage-made uh, video cameras that turn out to give us some pretty good summer vacation home videos from leatherbacks. We learn a lot from those things. We tend to appreciate a little bit more about what these turtles really are and what they can do. So I want to say before I close, I want to say thanks to all of you for deciding that on a Monday night you wanted to come into, into town and sit through a lecture. I know. I'm sorry about all the visuals, it's just been terrible, I'm sure, and in the IMAX. But just as this little guy reminds us, it really is the little things that can go a long way. So don't doubt your, your potential impact on helping turn the tide, or helping at least maintain the resilience in your turtles, right out of your backyard. Um, they're, they're in good hands, but they could use some more help. Why the disparity in the available biomass? We have a biologist in this crowd. <laughs> I love it. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, <laughs> nobody told me there'd be actual biologists here. Oh, man. Uh, it's a really fantastic question and not a very straightforward one. Um, so one, one way to start to describe it is where these guys are foraging is on the continental shelf. So you've got some shoaling, or you've got concentration of resources in a relatively shallow depth. And wherever you have that mixed into the mixed layer, so you've got light, you've got nutrients, you've got lots of good stuff, you're going to have a lot of productivity. When you get a lot of productivity, you get lots of other things that can develop in the same place. When it's predictable, that's even better. Then that means it's going to happen at a, at a typical cycle. Um, Carr can tell you a lot more about the environment here, but generally speaking, it's no coincidence that leatherbacks tend to be here in the summer. That, that has, it's basically the culmination of several months of buildup in, in, the, in, the, in coastal productivity, such that it leads to mature jellyfish having bloomed 
and are now of the nice ripe size for leatherbacks um, by the summertime. In the Eastern Pacific, on the other hand, you might have seen mostly where they're, where we've, at least where we've tracked them to, where they're foraging, is more open ocean. It's not on the shelf. Now there's some pretty significant upwelling areas throughout the Eastern Pacific, but a lot of those tend to be very, very close to the coast, the Humboldt Current coming off of Peru. And we know there are a lot of turtles there. Um, but as folks have probably heard, there's this little thing called El Nino that's starting to raise its head yes to, yet again. And this year, uh, folks are predicting a very, very strong El Nino. And what we've seen is that uh, and Dr. Saba, who I referred to before, actually did his PhD work on the effects of El Nino on the reproductive cycle of Eastern Pacific leatherbacks. There's a very, very significant response, basically, in basically the readiness of leatherbacks that are foraging in that area because of the frequency and severity of El Nino. It's much more frequent. It happens every three to five to seven years. And so in a leatherback lifetime, that's many, many times. So it really it, it affects that reliability as well as the distribution of resources. How do we get the cameras back? Lasso. Just kidding. <laughs> joke, joke. Okay. Uh, no, they, um, they're on a section cup, so they pop off. Uh, they can either be, you can, you can program them to pop off, basically to break that seal um, at whatever time after a couple hours. If you know it's only got, let's say, three hours or four hours of, of space, then you try to get it to pop off at that point. Um, sometimes they come off on their own, of course. Uh, what these guys would do on the boat is uh, have a, a radio tag a VHF transmitter on it as well. So they could track the turtle from a distance, you know, not to interfere with behavior, obviously, but at least to keep an eye on it so it didn't, these guys can move, so even in three or four hours. So they were able to kind of keep an eye on where the animal was so that when it popped up, it also floated in such a way that that transmitter would keep transmitting and they could go in and scoop it up. The satellite transmitters, though, those are fastened onto the shell and they could be there for many, many months, if not longer. They'll eventually, the links that, that bind them will corrode and they'll fall off on their own. Yeah. So the question was about uh, marine debris, in particular balloons, and what kinds of things we're, we're looking at along those lines as far as threats. You know, to be honest, it's a really good one, a uh, good question, because it wasn't really on a lot of people's radars until relatively recently. You know, we've had a lot of other kind of bigger fish to fry, if you will, bycatch and egg harvest consumption, things like that. Um, but there, there is a bit more information coming in the literature about the frequency and the amount of marine debris ingested by sea turtles and, and other critters. Um, but honestly, it, it hasn't been quantified uh, very well, um, by and large. There are a couple of studies, including one on leatherbacks, that kind of looked at the, the global uh, trend over many, many decades of at least the observation of plastics in, uh, in leatherback guts. And these are animals that would have stranded dead, and so they could be necropsied. Um, and as you might expect, the frequency of that observation has increased in the last few decades. Um, it can be as much as 30% of leatherbacks that are found with plastics in their guts. But it's not necessarily the cause of death. So it's not a, uh, um, it's not a totally clear thing. It needs more, more investigation. But certainly, um, if you're a leatherback and you see a floating jelly, it's going to be hard to distinguish between a jelly and a plastic bag. Um, so yeah, it's something that people are, are paying a lot more attention to now. Much. How do leatherbacks adapt to cold water and hot water? Here's where the talk goes from one hour to three hours. <laughs> <laughs> the other part of my thesis. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's a really, really fantastic question, and it is really fascinating. So there's lots of reasons. One, they're really big. So the bigger you are, once you're warm, the longer it's going to take for you to cool down, even if you're in really cold water. So that helps. Two, helps if you wear a jacket. So remember the 33% bigger when they're up in Nova Scotia and in cold water? That's fat. Fat is a good insulator, and so they tend to, that, that helps to pace, put a barrier between that cold water and their warm body. So that's another big one. Um, they can generate heat by swimming. So the more active they are, and what we see in Nova Scotia, despite the cold water, is they never really stop swimming. They occasionally, they'll observe them basking, so sort of sitting at the surface and just soaking it up on a nice sunny day, a rare sunny day in Nova Scotia. But by and large, they're always moving. And when they move, just like you, if you're cold, right? Start jumping, running in place, and you, you generate heat. Um, they also have ways of um, warming their, the blood when the, in their flippers. So when their flippers are further away from their core, where it's the warmest, then they'd have danger of losing a lot of heat through those flippers, right? Just like your fingers get cold in the winter. So they have special adaptations in their flippers that help the warm blood from their body 
warm up the cold blood coming from the extremities and in. So that way that cold blood doesn't come all the way into the body and then they have to reheat it. So they have lots of really cool adaptations actually. So if they get that much bigger, the question was if they get that much bigger, where does it all go basically, right? Um, so it, I mean, I used the football thing. I, I did read something in the paper recently about, I don't know, some football player or something. <laughs> And footballs, and I, I don't really know. Um, but it actually is a decent analogy. And it's funny because I've used it before about inflating footballs or deflating footballs. I swear. It wasn't just to rub it in. Remember, look at your rings if you're worried about it. Um, so, yeah, on the nesting beaches, you see almost, a, a, you know, in between those ridges. So you notice leatherback shells look very different to any other turtle you've ever seen. Instead of those plates, they've got keels, right, like a boat. Um, in between those keels on a nesting beach, you get kind of deeper troughs, literally. So as they fatten up under the shell, it sort of balloons them out. It inflates the ball more than they really need to, you know, obviously. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. It's just great. I'm in Boston. I got to do it. Um, also, I mean, they just are fat. I mean, you look at the, the, the picture I had up there of Cara and the one of those guys on the back of the boat. I mean, they are enormous animals. They fatten up in the neck. I mean, they literally look like somebody just kind of blew them up and everything just inflated. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's all fat and they pack it in under the shell, um, under muscles, et cetera. Yeah. So the, the, the body size doesn't get any bigger, right? That's skeletal, but it's all fat. Yeah. The impact of the Gulf Stream. Um, not much at all. <laughs> it's gone by there. It, it, at that latitude, the Gulf Stream has headed over to Europe. And so, by and large, what you're looking at are cold water currents coming from the north. Um, th I mean, the, you know, the Gulf Stream is further south than there. They do transit through the Gulf Stream on their southward migrations. Um, but the Gulf Stream doesn't really, it doesn't bathe Nova Scotia in nice warm water. The car could tell you a lot about the association between how leatherbacks navigate from up here down south and through the Gulf Stream and how much time they actually spend there. It's not quite as much as they tend to just transit right through those areas because they're on a mission. They go from their breeding areas, their feeding areas, and kind of cut right through major currents out. It's not that easy to see a turtle, especially when the seas kick up a little bit, even if you're sitting in a tower on a boat. Um, in, uh, in Monterey Bay in California, they have a spotter plane that helps them because NOAA uh, run, has been running the turtle captures, uh, the turtle program there for probably you know, equally as long as the, the projects here. Uh, so that helps. <laughs> Having a spotter plane helps. Communication, radio communication with the boat on the water and go check it out. In Canada, they have no such thing. These are fishermen who are willing to, to take Mike and his team out. And they kind of have some areas that they know they want to go to. Again, luckily, it's not, you know, um, it's relatively concentrated. They don't have to go too far offshore. They know the animals are going to be relatively close to the coast. Um, they get sightings. This is the importance of building a network of fishermen, of coastal communities, of teachers and school children and whomever. Now, they're not conducting class out on the ocean and telling them where to go. But they know, generally speaking, because of that network, they know when animals are starting to be sighted, when they might strand, when their entang entanglements start. So they start to have a sense of, okay, this year it's a little early. This year it's a little late. We're seeing them closer to shore, seeing them further away from shore. So kind of piece things together, basically. Um, the question was about, um, I, well, if I could paraphrase, and if I'm wrong, correct me, if, jelly, if uh, leatherbacks can actually put a dent in jellyfish populations, yeah, more or less? Um, no. <laughs> but we need more of them anyway. No, uh, it depends. Um, the blooms that you hear a lot about tend to occur in highly eutrophied areas. So these are areas that are maybe close to the coast where there's a lot of nutrients and runoff from human uh, causes and a lot of those areas aren't necessarily I know this is kind of an exception here because this is a good example of a place close to where humans can have an impact but other places where there are big jellyfish blooms um, they aren't really places that leatherbacks are foraging um, yeah and jellyfish they are some of the weirdest but most interesting animals in terms of life history so it depends on the species but generally they are live fast die young quick um, kind of life cycle they can they literally when we, they talk about jellyfish blooms that's it's like spring <laughs> except in this case it's summer and when they pop up they're there and then it, you know the cycles kind of start over so they're very ephemeral 
So these guys, probably not, but it couldn't hurt. Couldn't hurt to have more, I'd say. I don't see many, many others very interested in eating uh, lion's mane jellies. Okay, I, I understand I have two more. Sorry. You guys want to arm wrestle for it? <laughs> oh, sorry, the question was about um, the efficiency of leatherbacks in terms of long distance swimming compared to other sea turtle species. Um, and obviously they're the best and they're the coolest was, is the short answer. Um, but but um, it's, it, it, interestingly though, it's not a question that's been largely quantified, not, not analyzed um, the way scientists typically look at these kinds of things, looking at um, you know, hydrodynamic forces. Um, a colleague of ours with NOAA out in the Pacific Islands in Hawaii has looked at um, different satellite transmitter and tag attachments to different turtle species. And as, but in, in, in so doing is also sort of measured, you know, just the general shape and forces on a, on, the, on a leatherback form versus other turtle forms. I mean, they have the biggest, most powerful flippers. They can generate the most thrust. They tend to have reduced drag. Um, but interestingly, uh, the, the drag reduction is not as significantly greater with leatherbacks as compared to other sea turtle species as you might expect. But in terms of endurance, there's no comparison. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, we may think that single-celled organisms are really simple, but especially when it comes to chemistry, it's at the single-cell level that incredible chemical management is going on. It's where chemicals are produced. It's where chemicals are managed. It's where they're recycled. Um, so there's so much to get from just individual cells.